Thanks very much. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here, and it's a real honor to be asked to open this inaugural event of the Fung Global Institute. Um, and in, both in my personal capacity and as the Group Chief Executive of HSBC, I'm really proud of what Victor and William are achieving here in Hong Kong. When the center of the global economy shifts, so logically does its intellectual center. We can see this shift in action today as emerging economies begin to exert their influence on the global policy agenda. It is actually only just a decade since China's ascension to the WTO. At the time, it was a highly controversial move, and how much has therefore changed just within those 10 years. Few could have foreseen that China would now be a leading participant in the G20, or that Europe would agree to concede two seats on the IMF's executive board to make way for faster growing economies, or more remarkably, that Europe's leaders would go cap in hand to Beijing for help with their own debt crisis as they did last year. The financial crisis and the ongoing economic stagnation in the West, particularly in the Eurozone, have fast forwarded the transition of economic power. Asia's role is being redefined in our lifetime and great powers need great thinkers. We need to work harder to understand better the fundamental transition in world affairs that we're all witnessing and to acknowledge the challenges that it represents. That's why the creation of the Fung Global Institute is so welcome. It has the potential to be a center of new thinking behind the new global economy to be the think tank for the Asian century. And so I'm gonna use my remarks this afternoon to suggest three areas where I believe new thinking and leadership is needed. But first I wanna talk a little bit about the context of the near future. I want to give you a sense of the new global economy as we see it at HSBC. Our own research indicates that the so-called emerging economies have now basically emerged and they'll power global growth over the next four decades. They will contribute twice as much growth as the developed markets over this period. And by 2050, they'll be bigger collectively than the developed markets. Trade will be one of the primary engines of this growth as the new South-South connections revolutionize the global economy. As faster growing markets link up, creating new connections between Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America, Trade and capital flows between those areas will grow significantly, in our view, increasing tenfold by 2050. Now, the scale of the opportunity is huge, in part because the economic borders between many faster growing nations are still incredibly high. The potential has not been released. Removing these borders, such as tariffs and restrictions on migration, won't be easy, but work is already underway. Countries in Asia have already formed new political alliances. China itself is building ties around the world, and trade deals with Latin America are becoming commonplace. Asian markets are going to be hugely attractive. In our estimation, there are 26 economies globally which will have an average annual growth rate of over 5% every year between now and 2050. Ten of them are here in Asia. Beyond China and India, these include the Philippines, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and the Central Asian countries of Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Now, factors such as high standards of education and the rule of law will be key to whether this potential is fully realized. The OECD's PISA test suggests that China's education system is overtaking many countries in the West, with Shanghai leading the pack. And as a result of this and other factors, we project that China's income per capita will grow by more than 800% between now and 2050. And yet, by 2050, the seismic shift in the global economy will have only actually just begun. Even after all this progress, and by then as the world's largest economy, income per capita in China will still only be 32% of that in the US today. And so potential for further growth remains substantial. So that's a glimpse of the world as we see it. But of course, there are many challenges along the way which require new thinking and new approaches. In our view, the first challenge is to actually learn the lessons of history. History does seem to repeat itself fairly constantly. And the first challenge, therefore, is we all need to learn the lessons of the past few years. 
Now, I was in Hong Kong in 1997, and I worked closely with a number of people in this room in responding to the Asian crisis, both working with the HKMA when the Hong Kong dollar was attacked and when the Hong Kong Stock Exchange was attacked. And HSBC, we also worked with the central banks of Thailand and Malaysia and others to help them resolve the problems that that crisis brought to a head. And the reason I point this out is actually it was in part this experience that informed HSBC's own response to the global credit crisis in 2007. Our top markets team, including myself and a number of key colleagues, had actually been stress tested for real in Asia 10 years earlier. We had the playbook. We kind of knew how to respond. We'd seen this in 97, 98. So in 2007 to 2012 continuing, we had some practice about how to deal with financial market meltdowns. Now, Asia has learned the lessons of the crisis to avoid bubbles and to hold large foreign exchange reserve. And of course, post 97, 98, when the conventional IMF prescription was put into Asia, just as this was happening, many Western economies were walking straight into trouble. So let's take a few examples of that. First, in the UK. Like elsewhere in the West, UK bank lending conditions loosened significantly from the late 90s. Mortgage spreads halved, and mortgages were available for 125% of a property's value, because, of course, property markets always go up, as we know. The result was an unsustainable housing boom and a household debt-to-GDP ratio over 100%. That boom spurred on consumers, and the trade deficit expanded from 1% to 7% of GDP. And this was all financed by capital inflows, aided by high UK interest rates, which in turn put upward pressure on the UK's currency, and the strong pound supported the idea that the whole system was totally sustainable. When it unwound, sterling fell 30% on a trade-weighted basis, and against the US dollar, it fell from a peak of 211 in November 2007 to 135 just a year later. Second, take a look at the situation in the Eurozone. The stresses are strikingly similar to those caused by the dollar peg in Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia in the 90s. Those economies suffered from inappropriate inflexible currency pegs, which created capital inflows that were ultimately unsustainable. This is exactly the kind of unwinding which actually we're seeing now in Greece and Spain today. In both of these examples, the lessons of the Asian crisis of building up excessive leverage against inflexible exchange rates were not really learned. And as a result, there's a certain sense that Europe is having, in certain of its countries, an emerging market crisis. And the policy response to the crisis means that much of the developed world has joined the Bank of Japan in doing what it was doing back in 97, 98, providing cheap liquidity to the financial system. Since 2007, the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, and the ECB, together with the Bank of Japan, have expanded their balance sheets by more than 5 trillion US dollars. Combined, the balance sheets of these central banks now total 9 trillion US dollars. Inevitably, this liquidity will look to the faster growing market in search of greater yield. So while in the past we would have seen extreme credit expansion and property bubbles, and we have to some extent seen this in both Brazil and China, there is by and large evidence that the Asian markets have learned the lessons of 97. They are ready to protect their domestic economies from asset bubbles and over-leveraging, while striking an appropriate balance to remain open to global trade and capital and all the benefits that globalization has delivered. In addition, the Asian financial systems are better regulated, and there's much more direct control. And China in particular has pursued a careful approach to keep economic expansion at manageable levels. As Asia enjoys superior growth, it will increasingly attract risks, such as this glut of cheap liquidity. Now, learning from the mistakes of the past is the best firewall we have to ensure they're not repeated. And this is an area where Europe should take its lead from Asia. The second big challenge that we need to think about is getting the politics right. We must consider, in the new order of the new global economy, how Asia can assert an appropriate influence reflecting its growing profile in world affairs and its own interest in the resolution of key questions in the global economy. And chief among these questions right now today is clearly the future of the Eurozone. We must not underestimate the importance of a block of world economic activity encompassing 500 million people and a very significant part of global GDP. Speculation about the fate of Europe's single currency is rife. 
Banks with significant exposure are being downgraded, and the yawning disparity persists between the periphery and the core, between the surplus and the deficit nations. Yields on two-year German bonds are currently 0%, and those on Spanish two-year bonds, 5%. So you have in Europe a risk aversion that says, I would rather earn nothing and know I'll get my money back than take any risk at all. Debt clearly remains too high. Across the industrialized world, income levels are around 10% lower than pre-crisis projections had suggested. And despite the huge monetary and fiscal stimulus I talked about, those central banks have increased their balance sheets by five trillion, there's been absolutely no return to business as usual at all. The financial system is far from healthy. The Eurozone capital market is under massive stress and interest rate spreads are wide and the volume of available credit continues to contract. Against this backdrop, we think there are four essential steps to ensure the Eurozone remains intact. First, there needs to be Europe-wide deposit guarantees or deposit insurance provided by the EBA in Euros. The issue is both, is my bank solvent, but also is my currency going to remain with the value the Euro has today? So Euro-wide deposit insurance in euros, probably provided by the EBA. Second, we believe that we need an EU TARP, provided by the EFSF, or in due course, the ESM, to be able to recapitalize the European banks. Thirdly, a euro bond does need to be issued, which is the joint and several responsibility of all the European countries, and that money goes down into the troubled sovereign nations to avoid them having to tap the uh, global capital markets. And clearly, all of this implies a move towards some form of fiscal concordat. Clarity and leadership on these points will be vital, but actually, sadly, is completely missing at this point in time. And although there is no evidence of the political will necessary to make this happen, in particular from the stronger countries, all of the stronger currencies will lose countries, will lose out massively, should the Eurozone eventually fall to pieces. Of course, looking beyond Europe, Broader issues persist. The gravitational pull of the faster growing markets is proving to be more state destabilizing than many had expected. The structural decoupling witnessed over the last decade or so, with faster growing nations powering forward while industrial nations are left languishing, has shifted relative prices and wages. Commodity prices are up, Western wages are stagnant, and as a result, real incomes in the West are not robust enough, hampering debt repayment. And there's a real social issue of high and structural youth unemployment in many European countries. People talk about a two-speed European economy, but in fact, we're probably looking at a two-speed global economy. And there are potentially significant consequences to this. And therefore, in the West, politicians are beginning to assert control over completely new areas. And at the very least, central banks risk being embroiled in politics. Their independence in many areas is being challenged. So getting the politics right will be vital to easing the inevitable political tensions and preventing new imbalances and supporting the future growth I've described. And then this brings me to the last challenge, which is we all need to test the conventional wisdom that builds up. What are the unseen factors which could uncut our vision of the future? Few saw the financial crisis coming until it was too late. The dangers of consensus and groupthink are real. We saw them in Asia in 1997. Very few of us foresaw what happened on July the 2nd, 1997, which wasn't just the handover here, it was the attack on the Thai Baht. And actually very few of us saw the global credit crisis coming in the summer of 2006 into the summer of 2007. So there is actually a tremendous problem with groupthink and a tremendous problem with a consensus view building even amongst the intellectual classes. Now we can't afford to compromise the growth which will improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people over the coming decades. So we need a kind of class. We need people who will challenge the conventional thinking. We need new thinking and organizations like this institute will be the ones to provide it. For example, the world is expecting the role of the faster growing markets to change as they move from producers to consumers. So taking the broadest definition, Asia's middle class is now 740 million people and growing really fast. For many multinationals, therefore, Asia's consumers are just vital. 
Together, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan accounted for approximately 20% of Apple's $39 billion of revenue in the first quarter. In China, official data suggests that domestic consumption accounted for 77% of GDP growth in the first quarter. And that compares with a 55% share last year. Retail sales also continue to rise, up almost 15% in the four months of 2012. But you know, this notion of middle class encompasses a wide range of income levels. In China, the wealthy middle class spend 32% of their income on food, compared to the less wealthy middle classes, 41%. So, a sudden shock, such as a rapid rise in food, or energy prices causing a rapid rise in food, could effectively wipe out massive chunks of the new middle class, almost as fast as they've been created. And then there are the demographic issues to consider. China's population is aging rapidly. 25% of Shanghai's residents today are over 60. By 2050, a third of the entire population will be over 60. That's 450 million people. So that creates two issues. First, that a faltering labor supply starts to undercut growth. We've already seen shortages of labor in some areas of China. And second, a result of the one-child policy, each young worker could potentially be looking after six elderly dependents. Now, obviously, this points to a need for an enhanced savings infrastructure, but also to a broader challenge. And in each of the areas I've discussed, financial services will need to play a greater role. The revolution in trade must be matched by the development of stronger capital markets. So Asian financial centers will need to continue to grow rapidly to support expanding capital flows and to support the internationalization of the RIMBI and to support a growth of contractual savings industry. So we all have a responsibility here. The world is more interconnected than ever before. We've witnessed huge and rapid changes. The center of the world's economic growth, I believe, has already moved from west to east. For leaders today, whether in government or business, the primary challenge has become managing complexity in the face of this uncertainty. All of us have to continue to learn. All of us have to continue to challenge as we move forward. At HSBC, we've put in place a strategy and structure designed to help manage complexity and thereby facilitate and support the creation of the new global economy. We're committed to continuing to learn and playing our part in meeting the challenges and realizing the opportunities that lie ahead. And we are so pleased that William and Victor have set up the Fung Global Institute so that we have a center of intellectual excellence in Asia that actually provide huge intellectual content to the next 20, 30 years as actually the shifts of power, unless handled well, as Victor highlighted, will actually result in considerable security fragility in the world. Thank you. Far-sighted thoughts indeed. Thank you, Mr. Gulliver. You know, I just want to reiterate.